this is uh, 2009, and, and 1867, 68, 69, that 10-year period between 67 and 1867 and 1877, you know, most of your freedmen were coming out of slavery. Prior to that time, black folk uh, uh, would, could only get an education if they were A, free, uh, even though the city law didn't ban it, there was what we call crystallized public sentiment against any slave getting, a, getting an education. The freed slaves were big on education. As you probably know, in many states, it was illegal to teach slaves That's how right. to read and write. And you were uniquely fortunate as a free black if you could get an education. Now, one of the things that freedmen, from what I understand, they understood. They understood that they, were, they needed to be educated. And they understood that one of the things that was holding them back was that they were not able to, uh, to read and write this language. Uh, to me, black people could comprehend fast. Just, just like Harriet Tubman. She couldn't read. She made it to Pennsylvania. You hear me? Real talk. Without even, you, and she made it. One of the very first schools for black people was right down the street between 2nd and 3rd D and E Street Southeast. And, and there's no sign to mark it today. It was the, the Bell School. And it, it's a reminder of the extraordinary efforts that uh, free blacks had to make to secure an education in the face of a city, most of whose residents did not want them to have it, even though they were free. But if you recall some of the earlier history, uh, many of the freedmen that came, if we were told that they were ignorant, savage, and didn't read, but they were reading. They, they had uh, a language, and many of them read Arabic, and they spoke Arabic, and they read the Quran and things like that, but they were kept from learning English. So uh, they didn't read and write English, but they weren't unintelligent. They understood the need for education. So uh, right after uh, they were emancipated, uh, they were, there was this drive to become educated and learn English and to read and write English. One of the most moving stories that I'm, I'm aware of uh, that to me speaks to the essence of Barry Farm. Mm -hmm. It was told by General Howard when he was hauled before a congressional community on charges that he had misappropriated funds. And, and he tells the story of a young man who walked from Howard University, from Barry Farm to Howard University every day, seven miles, hmm. because of his tremendous desire to get an education. So in Barry Farm in particular, a lot of us the several buildings, the school buildings that were put up. Cheese, what's up, man? Excuse me. What's up? Hey, man. Speaking of college, y'all, uh, any of y'all know anything about Howard University? Are you talking about the time? How, yeah, Howard University. There's some cute girls up there, that's what I know. Do you know people that go to Howard University right now? Don't you feel like since the people in this community kind of help fund that, that you should be able to get a scholarship? Yeah. You plan on going to college? Mm -hmm. But I don't know if I'm going to have a university, but I'm going to college. You are going to go to college? Yeah. Well, I want to go be a musician. What about you? What you know about Howard University? You know anybody that goes to Howard? Yeah, he did. He went to Howard. Do you know anybody personally who went to Howard? What about you, Chief? You know anybody that go to Howard? You know about Howard? Any programs, anything they offer? Any classes? What about you? You know anybody that go to Howard? Hmm. And, and I don't know if we can get anyone to walk today hmm. from Barry Farm to Howard University. Hmm, hmm, hmm. But that also speaks to how closely uh, uh, brought together, knit together, Barry Farm and Howard University were. They share a common history. and. The relationship between Berry Farm and Howard University, obviously founded by the same man that was the motive force behind Berry Farm, 
um, it is strange, uh, it is troubling that Howard University today is not more closely involved in the Berry Farm community. Here at Howard University, I'm, I'm really inspired by what Howard University has become uh, and what it means to the black community. But at the same time, I have to be honest and acknowledge that the, there's a dubious sort of relationship between Howard University with regards to class in black America. Because this is a university, this is considered the Harvard of uh, historically black colleges and universities. Uh, and the masses of uh, African American people or people of color can't afford to be at the Harvard of, 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 of all these universities. So I think that begs us then to look at the class implications. Howard University was chartered in uh, 1867 and approved by the 39th Congress uh, and signed, signed into law by uh, the president then, Andrew Jackson, was that Howard University was to educate the four million freed slaves and the 40-something thousand free people of color that had come here not by way of slavery. Uh, now that's ambitious. For any institution of higher learning, particularly we're talking about in the mid to late 19th century, but it also tells us something about the posture that our institutions of higher learning should have towards our communities. Uh, that never should we ever forget that uh, the founders of these universities' uh, goal was to make our universities responsive to the needs, issues, and concerns of the black community. Not just some of the community, but all of the But all of, all of the community. You say out of 10 people from this neighborhood, how many you think go to college out of 10? Two. <laughs> Two out of 10? Two? Yeah, well, Two out of 10. How many think, how many graduate high school? Four. I'm gonna say four. Well, and I half, maybe five. five. Maybe yeah. five out of 10? Yeah. Graduate high school. So everybody else, what happens? If you're not the two or the five, then what happens? They yeah. don't damn. There was a reminder that, look, you're in the Northwest, but you're not part of, you're not part of BC. In, in the same sense that maybe someone who's quote unquote white is part of BC. So the so it was called Foundry uh, before it was called Florida. And if in fact you cross this lane, then you risk your life, you place your life in peril. Because again, uh, much of white people in DC resented the fact uh, that African Americans were even here. And so, I mean, there's all these constant reminders uh, for Howard University, whether it be their reaction and response to Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896, um, up until the sort of Brown decision, where Howard University students and law students and, and, and professors all took part in undoing that. Uh, but this is just all these reminders. It's a last I wish I could change back. Cause it's a lot of stuff been happening. You know, my my child friend, my childhood home. I ain't gonna see him till he turn forty. Right? You know, the other home man ain't gonna see him to to the other life, man. And so when you go back to Barry Farms now here in 2009, where our city government says, well, the intervention in poor communities is to displace them. Uh, you would expect. Um, you know, how are university students to come to their aid and say that this, this, th these policies are causing more harm than they're causing good? You what, represented DC. What's this about? In the house. That's on this Saturday from 4 to 6. We're going to have a community dialogue. We're going to visit this little known historic relationship between Howard University and Burry Farms, the community that you're in right now. And we want to focus on how can we build the relationship between Southeast, which is one of our host cities or host areas, one of our schools, and Howard University, and Howard University in DC in general. Take advantage of this opportunity, because it's, it's very rare to see Howard students in this mass number come all the way to Southeast. I went to Jamal's house this morning, reminded him to come down here, and he didn't know y'all was gonna be here. The first thing he said was, I wanna go to Howard, Howard, Man, I heard they got bait. That's what they say about females. <laughs> <laughs> they got yeah, bro, they got an education too up there for you. <laughs> so we want to hear from the youth. We have a lot of black men in the room. That's what's up. We see a lot of black young brothers in here. So we want to hear your perspectives.
when you look at moral example or when you look at the struggle of a man or the struggle of a thing, it's always good to look at it in a historical context where in the past there was more reading and education geared toward that. What did you learn about the history of your community in Anacostia? Yeah, I'm like, I ain't never going to try it, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Keep it wild. You went to Baloo? Did you go to class in social studies? No. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> They are, they are not being educated in a way where they can recognize the struggle of their ancestors, but how, how that plays a role in where they are today. And they're not inspired as a, as, a, as a result. I think their focus on math and science and reading is pivotal, but it's sad that we're at a point in our communities where our young people should be learning about culture, arts, history, religion, and ethics, values, social studies. Um, so we can teach them how to think and how to love and, and their brother man, not just in their community, but across the world. Let's break down the world history. What does that mean? How can you break that word down? And we say what? His story. His story. So what does that mean? What does that mean to you? Well, if, we, if his story is coming from Western uh, civilization, that will be the story, yeah. The his story to me, when I broke it down, his story, I'm thinking like, what you say, sister? I say each own person's interpretation, each own person's uh, outlook on what they've been through, not necessarily coming from uh, a Western uh, perspective, but coming from a Western perspective. Yeah. Um, and that's what I mean by um, taking everybody else's uh, personal struggles into consideration. It targets one area um, in one person's life. That usually, uh, accepted history is the history that's told by the women. So the, the people who've conquered, the people who have won the wars, the people who have taken the land, uh, their history is accepted and their interpretation of the history of the people is accepted, even by the people. At the inauguration, you know, I don't know if you all watched, but I watched, uh, I didn't come to D.C., um, but I watched President Obama make his speech. And in class the next day, we were reviewing his speech. It was in, I don't even remember the um, newspaper, I want to say like the New York Times or something like that. And they they quoted the the whole article was as though they were giving um, they were going to put like they were giving us Obama's speech in its entirety. But if you look at the speech and if you go on the internet, maybe you can find some sources where they leave out certain elements of his speech. And it's important just um, us as people to keep like even even though we cannot go back in time and change the things that have happened. Like we can't go back in time and remember things that we weren't there for. It's important that we preserve what's happening now because they were cutting off things about his relation like with his father to kind of denote different religious aspects and stuff like that. And that's important. So history is his story. And if you're not telling your story, someone else is telling it for you, right or wrong? Can we agree? So is it important to tell your story? Right, but first before you tell it, you have to know it. You have to learn it, right? I think it's important to historicize all that we do. I mean, the exciting thing about educating Negroes at the time was we can educate them with religious doctrines as opposed to educating them, uh, you know, in sort of the Enlightenment sense, right? You know, remember, we sort of, this nation emerged out of Enlightenment and it was about running away from religious dogma. But when it came to us, it was like, yeah, we need a theological institute to teach black people. Now, Howard had a deal with I should explain, there were, there were three, according to Bouchard, there were three mm -hmm. different groups of teachers. Mm -hmm. One was more religious, that is to say, they could, coming out of that um, Christian background, and they mostly were called missionaries. The American Missionary Association was one of them. There were three or four others. The Baptists mm -hmm. had one, I forget, um, Methodists and the Presbyterians had other ones. And they each sent, that is, they, they subsidized um, teachers who would go down to the South, or in our case, to Anacostia, and teach uh, the former freedmen and their parents. And the second part of the Theological Institute was also to have a teaching college, all right, because we also needed to have trained and 
less hostile to certain disciplined uh, Negro academicians teaching the children to come. Originally, the idea was to, to not only have theology, uh, but also to have education to, to continue the pacification of people of color. So when I tell the students I was, you know, my background is in, I had a background in law enforcement, they want to know how many people I arrested, how many people I chased, did I crash, you know, like did I shoot my gun and this kind of stuff. And, um, and, and that's all the exciting part, the, you know, the stuff that you see on television. Uh, but, and so I started talking about actual law enforcement, and I tell them, it's all, everything's exciting until I tell them, say, wait a minute, you know the manual that most police officers learn their codes, or what we call the laws. Uh, most of those codes started off in their uniform or around the country. There were black codes. There were codes around fugitive slaves. There were codes around police in our communities. Police in our communities. And, and that was the first book, the first manual around in law enforcement. Why do you, why do you think everything is painted so white and black in society? My pitch I always get is it go back to like slavery and then segregation. Then I throw about us getting our rights from off Martin Luther King that we was gonna be alright. But there's still some people that, you know, they still train on that black and white thing. Like I know I was uh I was I think I was at the Smithsonian uh, one year, which was like two thousand like one. And the man we was asking the man, can he uh he probably had took us on a tour. The whole time he was, he was trying to beat around the bush not to take us. But when the kids, some, some school came from Maryland or some all white kids came, he he jumped to take them on a tour. So our teacher basically was like, well, it's this, it's still some people out there that still ride with that black and white stuff. And I think that some of the issues we find that when we go into our job and our cultivation of our professional performances, it's hard for us to give back to our communities because the positions that we're in, especially not having a cultural commitment and understanding of who you are. And then you can't use your influence in your position to impact people in the communities that really need your help the most. I come out of work as a registered nurse to work in my community because I couldn't accomplish at work what I wanted to do. They wouldn't allow me. So I stopped taking a check in order to be my own person. You know what I mean? And it hurts me because those are not just white people. Those are black people that are hurting us because they've been trained to hurt us. That's their job to hurt us. What we want to do is make sure that we can have a well-rounded education and make sure that when we get to these positions, we can use our influence. Because think about it. Who are the number one consumers right now in this country? Consumers, right? Let's keep it real. The Cadillac trucks, the Fendi's, the Gucci's, all the free commercials in the songs. Right? How much of that do we produce? You see what I'm saying? So that's another concept you got to think about. How do I spend so much to these? And those companies don't, do they get, how often do they get back to your community? Where you spend your money? You see what I'm saying? So that's a conversation that we have to continue to have. How are we using our economic influence to empower each other? We had a discussion not too long ago, and it was basically about, um, it, he said a little bit about the Woody Living Letter, and how we have just been conditioned to not look out for each other as black people, to be prejudiced against our own race, to be racist within our own race. We um we don't often look out for each other and just with the whole um people like black people will leave their community, get an education, and then not go back to their community because we're not looking out for the better of ourselves. We're looking out, we're doing it from an individual basis basis and not a holistic um basis in terms of our people. Nobody wants to work so hard and then go back and try to build up other people and that's something that we need to change. We need to uh, find ways to get back to the people that we, you know, we're trying to find. I think the cultural and historical and moral and ethical principles that I've learned by looking at figures like Sam Edmondson and Frederick Douglass are prevalent. I think right now we have, I think our young people look to images like rappers and they look to entertainers and football players and basketball players. Not to say that those people aren't great, because they are. What Sean Puffy Combs represents is that Horatio Alger story, where he's pulled himself up by his bootstraps. In fact, the truth is that uh, Sean Puffy Combs was never poor. He grew up in a very middle class family. But the popular story is, is here's a young guy who pulled himself up by his bootstraps and made an empire a multi-million dollar empire who is on the verge of claiming 
near, nearly about to claim to be a billionaire in assets, right? That's the image that we want. That's the person who we value not only in Washington D.C. but in, in the society, society, the mainstream no society. Doubt. No doubt. Right. So you talk about value, and also what value does Sean Puffy Combs have to us? He's an example of what we. You know, the government doesn't want to hear us complain anymore about racism and sexism and all these other isms blockading the path of progress. Although we know it, it exists in this post-racial society. They want us to seize on people like Puff, Sean Puffy Combs and say, you can do it too. They want us to consume American Idol and say, all you need is talent and not connections. Yeah, in reality, right. this is just in a reality, it doesn't work that way. A lot of the people who are promoted to be examples of models, one, it's not realistic for the average person to get there, to attain it. Sure. The average person is not going to attain necessarily the big house and the Bentley. Sure. So if that's your goal, you're already stepping outside of your destiny right then and there because with the skill level that you develop and the talent that you have, that's what's going to lead you in the direction. And the goal can't be based on what this man did. That's to be based on what you're equipped to do. Sure. But what happens is we don't have these, uh, we don't have these different levels of success being promoted. True. We have the big CEO success, the big CEO success, the big money success, the sure. big money success, the big lavish life success. Get here, this is what you need to get. But those educators, uh, those community servants like myself and yourself, you know, we're not promoted in this country. Sure, sure. You know, we don't we we put the celebrities over the educators. You know what I'm saying? Which is backwards to me. The kids in these communities need to see people who look like them coming to help them because as y'all know right now there's a lot going on with the school system and they're kicking all the teachers out and this and that and everybody on the strike and basically what they're doing is they're throwing away all the teachers that look like the students who they're going to be teaching to bring their teachers that know nothing about them nothing about the conditions that they stand in the conditions they live in and what they go through on a daily basis and they can't relate to them so if you take me out of whatever situation it is and put me somewhere where i'm uncomfortable i'm not going to adapt to that very well so basically what they need is part of the black people close to their age range to come in and show them what they can be and have something to aspire to. To a lot of these kids, y'all can be role models. Because to a lot of kids right now, I'm a role model and I still look up to a lot of people myself. And I'm glad I got part of the black people around me to show me what to do and what not to do and how to curb myself in certain situations. Um, I want to also acknowledge the historians and the elders for telling us a little bit about DC and where we come from and who we are as a people because I know that that's something I myself didn't know before we started two hours ago and that's an important component to give to not only the people in these communities that live here but the students that attend and the people like myself who visit because my communities are much like yours and gentrification is happening everywhere and it's important that we really we really acknowledge everyone and and create a space where we can learn and we can continue to be a progressive people and take that back and really own who we are. Much of who we are was lost, was lost because it was stolen from us. Mm -hmm. You know, they took our language from us, took our culture from us. We weren't speaking English in Africa. We spoke a whole range of dialects, including uh, Arabic, Swahili and other kind of things. And he took that from us, took our culture from us, took our religion from us, took everything from us, and instilled their religion into us. Their culture I tried to into us. You know, their values into us. And and what street business is really trying to do is we're really trying to go in their grassroots and try and rebuild everything that was taken from us over these past three, four hundred years that that we that we lost. If we don't know where we come from, how can we have any real concept of what it is we want to be? And there's so much potential here. Uh, the biggest part of street business and what we do for our mentees is making sure that they, they have a, a good understanding of their potential and all that they can do in, in life skills, um, in their creativity, in their households, and how they can, how they can better themselves to better their communities. Amazing to think that at 14 years old, we were conceptualizing 
this. And to see you guys here, I want to also appreciate the mentors because it's an amazing feat that you've taken on to interact with these people and really become one with your community. It means a lot. We've been doing this for a long time, you know. <laughs> Thanks so much. You know, that's our community this is what we do it for and this isn't even where it started but this is where it needs to be we all deserve this opportunity and I don't even go to Howard you know what I mean but we deserve <laughs> the opportunity to be who we deserve to be in life if they're not getting the kids if we can't do it and we're like the same age like this is our generation you know what I'm saying so if we don't get to them if we can't get to them no one else is either so I think that is the best strategy because you know, we're the ones who are going to affect change for the younger ones who are going to affect change for those who are not born yet. So if we can't get through them, no one can. We're the last chance we have to care. Our, our brothers and sisters need not to focus on diamond rings, bling bling, but on, and, and we need to understand how people appropriate diamond mines. Hmm. Our brothers and sisters need to get away from playing PlayStations while people are out there building space stations, hmm. right? No one rises to low expectations, so we need to set the bar high. We don't cherish education anymore. It used to be a town I was growing up cool as hell in Memphis. Mother went to the fourth grade, father to the third grade. They were sheer crops on, on the farm. And uh, even going to events, you tell me, son, try to get you an education. Try to stay in school. Like, not try, she told me, you're going to stay in school. You don't try about that. <laughs> Things that young people think are are, are unnecessary or somehow square today, uh, our ancestors attached life and death significance to the getting of an education because they believed that was the primary lever by which they could pry themselves out of slavery and debasement and put themselves on the high plane of, of knowledge and self-respect. To me, this should be the most appropriate sort of um, context by which students will go out and before they go out into the world to practice their social justice skills and their, their what they're learning in the classrooms in the community. And the question is, is it is that there? I'm going to read something to you later that was written by one of the students here who thought, I'll accept the challenge and I'll go to Barry Farms. Mm -hmm. uh, but when he went into Barry Farms to shoot what would have been a small documentary for his class, mm -hmm. uh, what's, what he concludes is uh, he takes this very conservative issue about the people and say, well, you know, the reason why places like Barry Farm is uh, destroyed because the people within Barry Farms are destroying the community, right? And so this is very conservative posture. So the flip side to this sort of sort of bipolarism is that when they do go into uh, home or what's here, the home of uh, Howard University, it's this conservative kind of blaming the victim as opposed to helping the victim and these kinds yeah, of things. Yeah, no doubt. So, you know, these are some of the things that, that we need to um, definitely, definitely look at. Because as much as I am concerned about the communities beyond Howard, the black communities, I also do feel like Howard has the potential to help all of us.